I live in a small town and pretty much the only option I have for shopping is Walmart. What I really dislike is how many people I run into there. The place is always packed and because my town is so small, I always end up running into ex-classmates and people that I don't really like. I'm not the most social person in the world and I'm really bad at small talk. The other day I was at Walmart to pick up some vegetables. I knew exactly what I wanted to get so I figured I'd be in and out in less than 10 minutes. I'd use the self-checkout line and I'd be gone before I ran into anybody. Unfortunately, when I got to the produce section, I instantly saw Jane. Jane was a girl I knew in high school, and back then she made my life miserable. She was the stereotypical cheerleader type, even though our school was too small to have a cheerleading team. But you know the type. She was pretty and bubbly and passive aggressive. I remembered she'd always say these backhanded compliments whenever she saw me, like, Oh, you've lost weight, or that haircut is much more flattering than your last one. Honestly, she was terrible. And that day she was standing right next to the bananas, which was one of the things I really needed. I didn't have any other option. I had to go up and see her. I walked to the bananas pretending like I didn't notice her and angling my body in the other direction so she couldn't see my face. But of course she recognized me right away. Oh, Jennifer, she said. Hello. I smiled at her and said, Hi, it's uh, great to see you, but I gotta run. I grabbed the bananas and tried to leave, but she literally grabbed me by the shoulder and said, What's the rush? I didn't have an answer, so I just said, Oh, you know, I just gotta get back home. You don't like shopping here either? She said. Not at all, I told her. I was surprised that she wasn't insulting me. We actually had something in common. And then she said, Oh, I figured you'd shop at Walmart all the time, you know, because of the deals. And there goes the insult. She was calling me poor. Normally I'd just take it and leave, but this wasn't high school anymore. We were two grown women. She shouldn't talk to me like that, so I said, No, it's because I always run into the trashiest people. She flinched for a second. I could tell she was offended. Good. So I picked up the rest of the fruits and vegetables and left. Because I was feeling so proud of myself, I decided to treat myself to the discount cookies in the bakery section before I left. Why not? I had just rounded the corner when I saw a thin old man clutching his heart and gasping for breath. His face was all contorted and he looked like he was having some kind of heart attack or something. Unlike most of the other people at Walmart, he didn't look familiar. But even though I didn't know him, he was in trouble. I shouted, call 911, and then I ran to him. By then, he was already on the floor making the most terrible noises through his mouth. His eyes were rolled back in his head. I held him in a sitting position, careful to make sure his head didn't flop backwards like a newborn baby's. Just breathe, I told him. Someone's going to call an ambulance. He opened his mouth and started to gasp out a single sound. Gah, gah, gah. It'll be okay, you don't have to say anything, I said. And then he finished that sound with a sentence. Gah, gah, give me all your money. And just like that, he wasn't sick anymore. The whole thing was an act. He'd only pretended to have a heart attack so that he could trick someone like me into getting close enough for him to attack. With one hand, he held onto my wrist. With the other, he held out a long syringe that he'd kept hidden in his pocket. He pressed the tip of the needle against my arm skin, but he didn't push it in. Not yet. He was waiting for me to give him my money. I had to do what he said. I had no idea what was in that needle. My purse was hanging off my shoulder, so I lowered my shoulder down so that the purse would slide off. That way he could grab it and leave me alone. As I slid the purse toward him, I looked around at all the other people in Walmart. There were so many people here, and yet no one was doing anything to help me. They could tell that someone was attacking me, but they just stood there and watched. I knew that at least one of them called the police, but that didn't help me right now. Right now I needed someone to hit him and pull him off me before he could inject me with whatever chemical was in that needle. All these people that I knew, that I grew up with, and yet none of them was willing to just jump in and risk their own safety to stop this crazy person. He let go of my wrist and grabbed my purse. Then he looked directly into my eyes and said, Thank you. Now don't move. You won't feel a thing. I couldn't believe it. I'd given him what he wanted. If this guy was still going to kill me? Just because I tried to help him? Please, I said. Just take my purse and leave. Suddenly, someone came from the side and kicked the man right in the head. 
It was Jane. Her foot collided with his temple and he flew backwards. The syringe fell out of his hand and landed with a clatter on the floor. Jane was a typical housewife. She was probably a hundred pounds soaking wet, and yet she was on him like an MMA fighter. She pummeled him over and over, kicking and hitting until he didn't move. By the time she let him go, he was unconscious and the police had arrived. One cop took my statement and explained that this man had been roaming around the area, injecting people with deadly chemicals. They'd been looking for him for weeks and thanks to me, they'd caught him. I told the cop that I had nothing to do with it, it was all Jane. I walked over to Jane and thanked her. Her knuckles were bloody and she was still out of breath. Do you want to have coffee sometime? I asked. Sure, she said. I came out to my parents last April and it did not go well. I thought they'd be chill about it. I was very wrong. I sat my parents down and told them that I was gay. My dad got really quiet and didn't say anything, but my mom completely flipped. She jumped off the couch and started screaming. I was so surprised by the whole thing that I don't even remember what she said. Except for the last part. She told me to get out. I couldn't believe it. Out of everybody, my mom had no right to kick out her only son. When she was my age, her parents kicked out her older brother, Dirk. It wasn't the same situation, of course. He'd gotten into some gang problems, and after he'd been arrested for shoplifting or something, my grandparents cut him off completely. Whenever my mom mentioned my Uncle Dirk, she always got really sad and said that she wished her parents had handled things differently. And now here she was, doing the exact same thing to her own child. It was really messed up. I was still in high school at the time, so I didn't have any money to get a place on my own, but I had plenty of friends that I could stay with. I very quickly gathered up all my stuff and left. I didn't even get to say goodbye to anyone. Once I'd gotten out of the house, I called my best friend Stacy to ask if I could crash at her place. I didn't even have to explain what happened. She could tell from my voice that I'd just been kicked out. Her parents liked me a lot so there wasn't any problem with me spending the rest of the school year in their basement. After I moved in with Stacy, I didn't hear from either of my parents. The next few weeks were the worst weeks of my life. Stacy and her family were super supportive, but they were the only ones who knew that I'd been kicked out. I didn't tell any of my other friends in school. I think a couple of them knew that something was off, because it was hard for me to hide how depressed I was. But I didn't tell anyone the truth, and no one ever asked. Then one weekend, Stacy and her family decided to go visit her grandparents a few hours away. They invited me to go with them, but I didn't want to intrude. I already felt like I owed them so much. So they left on Friday night and let me spend the weekend by myself in their house. I read a little and watched some movies. Nothing too interesting. But then on Saturday night, I got a text. It was from my mom. She said, Cody, I'm so sorry about everything. Please come home. I knew right away that something was off. My mom always used emojis when she texted. She abbreviated a lot of stuff too. This message didn't sound like her at all. I responded, who is this? She responded, it's your mom, sweetie. Come home. My mom never called me sweetie. This was obviously an imposter, but the messages were coming from her phone. I decided not to respond, but then a minute later she wrote, Where are you? Why aren't you home right now? A chill ran down my spine. You know why I'm not there. She didn't respond for a while, and then she again asked me where I was. I figured she knew that I was staying at one of my friend's houses, but she didn't know which one. I wouldn't tell her anything. I was imagining the worst, that she'd hired some sort of counselor to come find me and scare me straight. Maybe that was the person texting me. I worried that if I told her where I was, she'd take me to a therapy camp or something. I decided the best thing to do was to just ignore any other messages she sent. She sent one more message demanding that I come home. And then nothing. I put my phone down and tried to forget about it. But I couldn't shake my uneasy feeling. After weeks of no contact, getting text messages that were clearly not written by my mom seemed very strange. I tried watching another movie, but I just couldn't concentrate. After a while, I turned off the TV and decided to walk to my house. I knew that was a stupid idea, but I figured that I could just hide in the bushes around my backyard and try to see if something was going on inside. No one would see me, and I'd be able to tell if there was some pastor or preacher or someone waiting for me to come back. 
I just needed to get some answers, so I pulled on my coat and walked down the street. My house was three blocks away, and as I walked there, I made sure to stick to the shadows. When I arrived, I snuck into the back and tried to look through the windows. Thankfully, the lights were on, so I could see clearly inside. I saw both my parents sitting on the sofa. It seemed normal, but as I looked closer, I saw that they were both tied up. And then a tall man walked into the room. He was covered in tattoos and carrying a gun. He was holding them hostage. It didn't take me long to realize that this was my long-lost Uncle Dirk. Despite years of hard living, his face was recognizable. He looked a bit like my mom. He shouted something at my parents, but I couldn't make out the words. I got closer to the window so I could hear. Please, my mom said, just take whatever you want and leave. I don't want your stuff, my uncle screamed. All I want is to destroy your perfect family. It's not fair that you have everything and I have nothing. Now tell me where your son is. He cocked the gun. This was insane. My uncle wanted to kill my entire family because he was jealous of us. If he only knew how imperfect we really were. I dug my phone out of my pocket and called 911. I told the policewoman my address and then hung up before my uncle could hear me through the window. But I was too late. I looked back into the living room and I saw my uncle's furious face staring at me through the glass. With one punch, he broke the window and grabbed me by the neck before I could move. I punched wildly, trying to get him off me, but he wouldn't let go. He pulled me through the broken window and into the house. He didn't realize that I grabbed a jagged piece of broken glass on the way, and once I was inside, I slashed at him. He dropped the gun and dove at me. I slashed at him again. Don't hurt my family, I screamed. He threw me to the ground. The glass fell out of my hand. As he stood over me, he reached to the side and grabbed his gun. He kept repeating the same thing. Perfect family, perfect family. I knew he was going to kill me. He was going to kill us all. But suddenly the front door burst open and two policemen rushed inside. They forced Uncle Dirk to drop his gun and then they cuffed him and led him away. After a third policeman untied my parents, my mom ran toward me and wrapped me in a big hug. You're okay, she said. You saved us. Yeah, I could tell that the texts weren't coming from you, so I came over, I told her. That was Uncle Dirk, huh? Yes, she said. He just got released from jail. I had no idea he hated us so much. She hugged me tighter. I could tell she was crying. She apologized for kicking me out and begged me to forgive her. She wanted me to come back home. She said she accepted me the way I was. Dad was standing off to the side, still not saying anything. But he was smiling at me, waiting for my answer. Thanks, I told them, but I'm not ready to come back. I'm glad you're safe now but you're going to have to earn my trust again. And I left. I went back to Stacy's house and went to bed. Since then, I've been talking to my parents more and more. I still haven't forgiven them for kicking me out. But I'm starting to. After all, they'll always be family. Her eyes were glazed with the reflective film of tears and it was this that first rooted me to the ground when I turned to the tools area of the Walmart. It was strange that I had never felt such panic for a stranger at first glance. The dullness of her expression struck deeper than simple tragedy. It felt much more complex to my perception, and when I tried to glean from it, she had already begun to move. My grip on the handle of my cart tightened. The greasy surface of moist sweat made me heave my load a few times. In all ways, I knew I was struck and it was not in a way that I could put aside and move on with my life. I scanned my environment and took my first few steps towards this woman. She started to look back at me, and then suddenly behind her from where a man emerged in a black tee, jean pants and runner shoes. He seemed younger than she was by the creases on her face, and how worn thin she appeared while he was sharp and agile. In a matter of seconds I could sense what was wrong when his impatient feet covered the gap between them and he cornered her into the rack of hand tools. His eyes narrowed, and he peered down on her and hissed in the same breath. I stepped out of the corner of his gaze and into the corner, with my hands on my chest to ease my panicked respiration. The man carried an aura of trouble that was unmistakable, and I sensed she was in danger even in such an open space as the Walmart. Standing by the corner, it seemed as though by providence nobody else ventured into the tool section to get anything no matter how hard I prayed for it to happen. 
You think you're some smart one, eh? Passing papers around to staff here is going to help you. His sibilance stung my spirit with the venom of a deadly reptile. My head spun, and I imagined a dozen ways that I could help her, which would not involve me getting into the way of this depraved man. I wished I had brought my device with me and not forgotten it in my car as I always did when I was in a hurry. It was a few minutes past 2 a.m., and I was only a woman, no taller than he was and by no means any muscular. I hated my guts and hated that I had gone out of my way at such a time to get tools to fix a cabinet that could have waited till dawn. Please, Carl, don't hit me, the woman begged, and it was the dry, throaty yearning of desperation that made me move one foot to her rescue from where I had tucked myself. He laughed crudely. The wheezing that followed was diabolical, and it sent shivers down my spine. I stood in the corner in wonder of how I had become part of a terror episode between two strangers whom I barely knew. My heart was in a frenzy, and I could not wait for it to be over, so I could be on my own way. I snuck my head through the corner of the hand tools frame and peeked. The man was towering over her. I'm not going to hit you, Magdalene, he said after his laugh. I realized just how shallow my respiration had become from fear, and I tried to deepen my inhalation. I did it twice, and exhaled only once. My second attempt at breathing out was caught shortly by the cold tone with which this stranger delivered a death sentence, and casually went on to bring it. I heard him grapple with some of the tools on the frame where I stood. He fetched a lengthy screwdriver which was the size of my forearm, and he drove it straight into her belly. My knees buckled at the sudden burst of savagery. My senses turned numb. The hubbub of so many hand tools and the chaos of silence fell cruelly on me. Nothing mattered when my head began to bang as the smell of death wafted from where the couple had fought to where I stood. What followed was repeated thuds of the same frequency, the pulling out and pushing in of steel into the depths of flesh. I could not tell their grunting apart in all of the brutality which I allowed only my ears to hear, even though I would rather not. My mind did a horrible job of allowing the reel of his violent stabbings play in my eyes. A loud ball of escape in the form of a scream latched onto my throat and swung rapidly through the pits to the top of my tongue. My idle hand was quick to muffle the noise. I suspected the woman did not scream because if she did, I did not hear it. My vision rebounded with the rhythm of my heart, and with each passing moment, my vision tunneled to the narrow channel of my escape. My head spun when I tried to reconcile the madness I had beheld. It felt like a moment out of a movie which translated cleanly into uncomfortable reality. My fingers were shaken, and so were my limbs. My grip on the tools basket which I had collected slackened. The hairs on my skin were on the edge, and I felt an acute awakening to all that was around me. I could not breathe, and I had begun to wobble on my feet. I lifted my eyes to the heavy lights once, and I knew I had to make the run for it. I intended to do it with a lot of stealth if I was to get out of there alive, but fate had other designs because as soon as I lifted my feet off the floor, my position was given away. The sole of my sneakers had kissed the floor of the Walmart, perhaps from the clumsy pressure of my entire being, and it had become stiff to peel away. Who the hell is there? He belted as I stepped out of the corner. On his hands was the trail of her crimson essence, and I did not need any explanation as to why she lay on the floor so lifelessly. My tools basket slipped from my hands and crashed to the floor. His scowl of perplexity eased into satisfaction when he saw how much in fear I was. I knew why he smiled. He would capture me even if I ran and he would use me as leverage to escape in a car, after which he may then kill me off before fleeing across the country. Damn, I muttered, and instinct kicked in when he started to run towards me. I went through with the motions which I was yet to decide and neither of us saw it coming when I bent down to my spilled tools to blindly fetch a hammer. I swung it in the same motion to discourage him, but he was already too close to duck. The steel edge of the hammer caught him around the back of his ear, and neither silence nor words passed between us as I watched a terrible monster lay dead on the hand tool's floor.